Our first presenter is Dr. Rajiv Kumar. Dr. Kumar founded Rocky Mountain Movement Disorder Center in 2007 and has been practicing in Colorado and Texas since 1998. He received his MD from the University of Saskatchewan, trained in neurology at the Mayo Clinic, and received fellowship training with Dr. Anthony Lang at the University of Toronto. Dr. Kumar has extensive experience treating Parkinson's disease, Huntington's disease, dystonia, and many other movement disorders, and he is a widely published author of these conditions. Dr. Kumar is an expert in movement disorders clinical research and has served as the principal investigator on more than 100 clinical trials. You can learn more about what research he is doing in the Rocky Mountain Movement Disorder Center booth in the Conference Expo. Welcome, Dr. Kumar. Well, thank you very much, Jody, and uh, thank you to your colleague, Elena, for inviting me to present to the community today. I hope I can make this presentation interesting, entertaining, and hopefully valuable to uh, so many individuals and families who are affected by Parkinson's disease. Today, I've been given an overwhelming task, which is to provide information in, uh, all by myself in the, about 45 minutes or so about Parkinson's disease research. So I have to pick and choose uh, what I think would be hopefully most interesting to the group. So uh, first of all, let me say that I'm, I, there's no way I can cover everything. I'm not going to cover any routine or standard or, or clinically available therapies for the most part. I'm just going to talk about experimental therapies. This is going to be a pretty rapid tour. It's going to, to I'm going to talk about what is interesting to me as a clinician. Uh, what I'm going to speak about is largely what is, what is, uh, what is very current. And indeed, uh, some of the material I'll be showing what has just been made public or been uh, presented this week at the American Academy of Neurology meeting. And so everything you're gonna see is really what's new this year uh, or perhaps the last couple of years in trends in clinical trials and clinical research in Parkinson's disease. I'm not going to be speaking today about basic science uh, in uh, pathophysiology of Parkinson's disease, except where it pertains to clinical research. And I will be speaking quite a lot about opportunities for individuals and families that are affected by Parkinson's to participate in clinical research because it's only with your involvement that we can develop better treatments and a cure for Parkinson's disease. So uh, hold on to your hats. We're going to go pretty quickly because we've got a lot of material to cover. So these are my disclosures. And as you can see, I am involved with working with a number of device and pharmaceutical companies to develop new therapies in Parkinson's disease. So, as you all know, Parkinson's disease is a slowly progressive brain neurodegenerative disorder that begins in a prodrome, meaning that there are many symptoms that occur before the diagnosis occurs. And these prodromal symptoms include constipation, a sleep disorder called REM sleep behavior disorder, where there's enactment of dreams, and then often there's reduction in smell, changes in mood, perhaps change in circadian rhythm and daytime sleepiness, and then at time zero, a motor diagnosis of Parkinson's disease, characterized by the typical clinical symptoms, often of slowness, stiffness, tremor, impaired gait. With levodopa therapy, there can be significant improvement. However, the development of motor complications typically ensues with motor fluctuations where individuals can tell when their medication kicks in and wears off in terms of improvement. And this may be complicated by the development of excess involuntary movements, which we call dyskinesia. As the disease progresses, there is increasing development of non-motor symptoms, such as cognitive impairment, difficulties with, with hallucinations or delusions, which we call psychosis, and the development of motor symptoms which don't respond well to levodopa, such as freezing of gait and falls, trouble with balance, and trouble with swallowing. And unfortunately, cognitive impairment can become the very dominant feature in very advanced Parkinson's disease. Now, as all of you know, we do not have a treatment which has been shown to slow the progression of Parkinson's disease. We have a number of very good symptomatic therapies, but we need both treatments to slow the progression, no doubt, and we need better treatments for the symptoms. So uh, I've been uh, spending my whole career really working on this topic, and there are a number of exciting clinical trials of new therapies that are ongoing. Uh, as depicted here. So you can see uh, on the top half of the circle, we have large numbers of disease modifying therapies that are being studied and many new symptomatic therapies that are targeting different, different areas of biology. Now, 
When we think about Parkinson's disease, there are many uh, things that come together to perhaps cause Parkinson's disease. We know there's a strong genetic predisposition, both individual genes that can by themselves cause Parkinson's disease, and a number of what we call alleles or variants of different genes, which together uh, uh, cause some increase in risk to get Parkinson's disease. There's changes on top of the genome, which we call epigenetic modifications, and these combine and interact biologically with different environmental factors, such as, for example, well water exposure, pesticide exposure, and protective factors, such as, for example, smoking has been shown to be. These biological interactions uh, then combine. And you can see in blue here, we have this uh, square. So all of these things combine over time, added with age, these things, unfortunately, can, develop, can result in the development of Parkinson's disease. And Parkinson's disease occurs really as a result of a number of cellular processes that go awry. There is, of course, uh, typically development of uh, misfolding, aggregation, and propagation of a protein in the brain called alpha-synuclein that we believe spreads from cell to cell. There's impaired clearance of uh, aberrant proteins, including alpha-synuclein. There is inflammation in the brain, which is thought to hasten the the progression of, of Parkinson's disease that is set up by this misfolded protein. And there's abnormalities of energy metabolism and mitochondrial dysfunction that is caused that increases the vulnerability of cells and as a result results in cell death and progression of symptoms over time. So I, I've mentioned genetics in Parkinson's disease. We know that individual genes can cause familial forms of Parkinson's disease. And this accounts for around 5 to 10% of individuals uh, in the United States who can be found with detailed genetic testing to have an individual mutation. And the availability and ubiquity of genetic testing has now come into the fold. So uh, the majority of patients now can and should get genetically tested uh, if they are interested in participating in new, uh, very specific genome-specific therapies, which we'll talk about in a moment, that will be targeted towards specific mutations and can really change potentially the course of Parkinson's disease. So if you have Parkinson's disease, I would encourage you to speak with your physician about the possibility of doing genetic testing. And in fact, there are very good free genetic testing panels that test for many of the familial forms of Parkinson's disease, much more beyond what can, was done for free than the 23andMe or Michael J. Fox Foundation. I'm talking very detailed genetic panels are available now, and some of them are, are free indeed. In addition to these individual genes, which, in, which can be mutated and cause familial Parkinson's disease, we have a number of risk factor genes that together explain another uh, approximately 10 to 15% of the risk of developing Parkinson's disease. So we know that there's a strong uh, genetic risk factor that can cause Parkinson's disease. As well, their interaction with the environment, which as we've talked about already, together we think comes to cause comes together to cause Parkinson's disease. I'm gonna talk about, about three different forms uh, or mutations or genes that can cause Parkinson's disease today. I'm gonna to first of all speak about synuclein. Now, the mutation in the alpha synuclein gene was the first mutation found to cause familial forms of Parkinson's disease. Individual point mutations can cause familial Parkinson's disease in which if you have it, each each of your children would have 50% chance of inheriting the abnormal gene and subsequently has a substantially increased risk of getting Parkinson's disease. In addition, if you have an extra copy of this gene, so-called uh, uh, triplication, this can also cause uh, familial Parkinson's disease. So the, the understanding about uh, this mutation led to individuals figuring out that the protein encoded by this gene, which is called alpha-synuclein, is really a protein that's found in many brain cells or neurons, and is important in the communication between cells and especially the, uh, the function of synaptic vesicles, which, control, which contain brain chemicals or neurotransmitters, which allow communication between nerve cells. And so this goes awry. Uh, this this, this normally, uh, normal functioning protein gets hijacked and functions abnormally and contributes to development of Parkinson's disease. Now, I've already mentioned that mutations can cause Parkinson's disease. And in fact, if one looks at the brain of someone with Parkinson's disease, we, one sees abnormal accumulations of this protein alpha-synuclein. And 
when these proteins uh, uh, prop, uh, come together from individual monomers to what's called oligomers to fibrils, and then eventually form this proteinaceous um, intracellular inclusion called the Lewy body, um, uh, that is the hallmark pathologically in the brain of Parkinson's disease. We now understand that thinucleon uh, that is aberrant and misfolded is found not only in the brain of patients with Parkinson's disease, but we now are beginning to understand that Parkinson's disease is a systemic disease. And we can see um, abnormal synuclein in, in nerve cells, including the, the tips of nerve cells throughout the body, even in various organs, such as the gut and the skin. Now, as a result of this, um, the alpha synuclein misfolding, that is toxic to cells and can, can cause the neurons then to, to have dysfunction and disrupt energy production, eventually resulting in cell death. We think that there's this concept of misfolded alpha synuclein in one cell passing outside of the cell in the extracellular space and then being taken up by the nearby cell. And that misfolded alpha synuclein can interact with normal alpha synuclein in the healthy neighboring cell and cause it to misfold and so propagate the disease from cell to cell throughout the brain and indeed throughout more of the body. And there are, this results in the potential for in clinical intervention with new therapies, including immunotherapies, to block the spread of misfolded alpha synuclein throughout the brain and throughout the body. And one of the concepts that has arisen over the last 20 years or so is the so-called Brock hypothesis. This is not a foolproof or, or completely proven concept, but this is true in a very high percentage of patients with Parkinson's disease, is that we have a spread from the periphery to the bottom of the brainstem, upward throughout the brainstem. It's only in stage three of the so-called Brock staging system that one gets loss of the dopamine cells. And then there's further propagation of the alpha synuclein and Lewy body formation in the cortex or the memory and thinking areas of the brain, which results in increasing non-motor symptoms and cognitive impairment in advanced disease. So the spread throughout the brain as a result of the connections is considered to be important in our thinking about Parkinson's disease and how we might intervene. And here we see another diagram where we see that alpha synuclein, the normal alpha synuclein protein is, is generated in the cytoplasm as a result of the mRNA passing from the nucleus to the cytoplasm. The alpha synuclein can uh, become misfolded. It can come together and aggregate and develop fibrils. Alpha synuclein can propagate between cells, and this is an opportunity for us to potentially employ passive immunization with antibodies directed against alpha synuclein, or we could vaccinate individuals against components of alpha synuclein and take advantage of one's own immune system to, you, to develop antibodies to sop up the alpha synuclein when it passes extracellularly from cell to cell, and hopefully results in slowing of, of progression of Parkinson's disease. There are a number of clinical trials that are ongoing or have been completed recently looking at these immunotherapy techniques. We can see that uh, Roche has a large-scale study of their drug prasinizumab, and we'll speak about that in a moment. But uh, the Pasadena trial recently uh, reported out last year, and there are some very interesting and positive data report about that. And uh, this antibody was tested via IV infusion monthly, and we saw that there was slowing of progression of motor findings of Parkinson's disease as measured both by the clinical raters and by digital rating of the individual's movement uh, speed. Uh, and this was quite uniform. In all of the treated groups were better than placebo after a year. So there's long-term open-label extension studies going on, testing the effect of this immunotherapy now up to five years. Another antibody was developed by a company called Biogen, and it was very similar, but targeted a different component of the alpha synuclein protein. And unfortunately, although they used a very similar study design, they did not find that there was slowing of progression of disease. There are many, multiple other companies, including AstraZeneca, Takeda, and Lundbeck, which are developing similar alpha synuclein antibodies directed against different components of the protein, which will likely enter clinical trials very soon. 
And then a company based in Austria has developed an active vaccination strategy, uh, vaccinating individuals to gain subcomponents of the alpha-synuclein. And again, as a result, antibodies are developed by the individual to directly uh, attack and prevent alpha-synuclein spread. So the top line results of the Pasadena study were that although there wasn't slowing all measured by the clinical symptoms, the motor examination was uniformly better in those individuals who received the therapy. As we can see, hopefully <clears throat> to work on this graph on the bottom right. And what we do see is in the top blue, we see a higher degree of progression compared to the treated groups in the lower lines. And so this uh, is, is very uh, exciting because it's the, one of the first major large scale phase two studies which show potential slowing of progression of Parkinson's disease using uh, this unique strategy. Now, and then, as I mentioned, the SPARC trial performed by a biogen was not found to be positive. Now, some of the advantages of this immunotherapy strategy is that we can show that we are actually targeting the pathogenic protein. We can show that these antibody therapies seem to be very well tolerated and quite safe, even after giving, being given for two or three years now. And we can see that there's a reduction in the alpha-synuclein um, protein in the blood. However, because of the blood-brain barrier, only a very small amount of the antibody can get into the brain. And we can't really show that there's a reduction in brain alpha-synuclein because we don't have a way to image alpha-synuclein yet. But that I think is coming very soon as I'll show you in a moment. So we shall see whether or not this indeed holds true. Because of the positive, bio, because the positive Roche study of prasinizumab, the Pasadena study, a new study called the Padova study is just about to begin. And so we are currently uh, enrolling subjects who have Parkinson's disease for less than three years and who are doing well. They don't really can't tell when their medication kicks in or wears off and they haven't developed dyskinesia. And they're only taking by itself either selegiline or resagiline, which are, which are MAOB inhibitors, or they're taking only low doses of levodopa. And so individuals who fit these criteria may be able to participate in this very exciting, promising double-blind placebo-controlled trial to see if we can confirm and extract, extend the result of the previous Pasadena study in this new study called uh, Padova. Now, there are other strategies to target alpha-synuclein, including giving, giving, giving small oral molecules to individuals to see if these will go into the brain and prevent the aggregation of alpha-synuclein. It's thought that the individual molecules, the so-called oligomers of alpha-synuclein, are really not very toxic. But once we get aggregation into clumps, so-called uh, uh, um, uh, in, from monomers to oligomers and fibrils, then we start getting cellular toxicity. There are other strategies also that could be helpful, including uh, um, uh, drugs which are called C-able inhibitors, which inhibit a specific pathway important in the so-called autophagy, which is the process by which the cell mops up dysfunctional proteins. So a number of C-able inhibitors are currently um, have gone or undergoing uh, clinical trials. Um, uh, and we shall see whether or not they are helpful. Many of them show uh, substantial promise in animal models of Parkinson's disease. The largest uh, C-able inhibitor trial that was completed in the past one to two years were studies of nilotinib. And you might have heard about this drug because this is a chemotherapeutic agent used to treat a, for a certain form of chronic leukemia. However, much lower doses have been tested in Parkinson's disease to engage the autophagy system. And in initial open label small studies, there was quite a tremendous benefit seen in small studies done by our colleagues at Georgetown University. However, a very large multi-center study did not show that nilotinib was effective because they could not show that they might very much gotten to the brain, did not change biomarkers of Parkinson's disease, it didn't change the amount of dopamine production, and it did not show other biomarkers supporting efficacy, although it seemed to be safe and a tolerable medication. So the conclusion was that nilotinib probably is not a good medication to target this pathway, and perhaps other molecules might be better looked at to work in this way. Now, this concept of one Parkinson's disease is really now beginning to go away. We're beginning to understand there's a great deal of variation from person to person. 
both in the clinical features, the genes involved, the pathway by which cells die, and even if one looks at the brain or peripheral tissues in individuals with Parkinson's disease, that the pathology varies quite a lot. And so, as a result, we are beginning to think that the strategy of treating everybody who has Parkinson's disease with one specific therapy to try to treat symptoms or, more importantly, slow the progression of the disease is not the right way. Because a certain population may respond to the therapy, others may have no effect, and others may have adverse effects, as we see here on the left side of the slide. And as a result, we're missing individuals who could benefit. Instead, increasingly, because we're recognizing this heterogeneity of patients with Parkinson's disease, we think that we need to have a precision medicine approach where we subgroup individuals and we focus with individual therapies for individuals so that we can slow the progression of Parkinson's disease appropriately for, new, for, for each individual. And indeed, in order to, to take this precision medicine approach and have more focused therapies which show clear target engagement for how the disease progresses in different individuals, we need to be able to differentiate different forms of Parkinson's disease. So we have the Parkinson's diseases. An important way of doing so is to understand the genetic factors responsible for Parkinson's disease in every individual, so we can better target the treatment for you as an individual. So increasingly now, we think that genetic testing is going, is, uh, going to become the routine for all patients with Parkinson's disease. So I'm going to now talk about LARC2 mutations and mutations in another gene called GBA or glucocerebrosidase. So LARC2 is a very important uh, uh, enzyme, uh, and we know that mutations in the gene that codes for this enzyme are, is responsible for the protein or enzyme actually becoming more powerful and having a greater degree of enzymatic function, which is uh, toxic to brain cells. And we know that this is the most common form of familial autosomal form of Parkinson's disease in the world. And it accounts for around 5% of individuals with Parkinson's disease in the United States have a mutation in this gene. Certain populations have much more uh, common mutations who have patients with, uh, you know, who have, um, have LARC2 mutations. So, so if we look at patients who have uh, familial Parkinson's disease, about 4 or 5%, have LARC2 mutations, it's probably higher than 1% of individuals who have sporadic Parkinson's disease who have mutations probably more like 2 or 3% or even higher, depending on the mix of ethnicities in the population you're studying. So if we go, for example, to Israel, we're going to see that about 25% of individuals or 20 to 25% of individuals have LARC2 mutations. And if we look specifically at North African Berbers, we see 40% of individuals, Ashkenazi Jews, about 15%. And Males and females are affected equally. Unlike sporadic idiopathic Parkinson's disease, we see about a 60-40 split favoring men with Parkinson's disease. Now, if you have a mutation in LARC2, this doesn't 100% mean you're going to get uh, Parkinson's disease. But we can see that about 25% of individuals who have a mutation in, with, who are Ashkenazi Jewish will develop Parkinson's disease by age 80. And if you have a mutation you're not Ashkenazi Jewish, actually, the penetrance is even greater, about 40 to 50 percent. So it'd be nice to see if we can reduce the activity of the aberrant LARC2 enzyme in the face of mutation. We also know that normal individuals who don't have a mutation can have varying forms of LARC2, which can cause different levels of enzymatic activity. And those individuals who have a higher degree of LARC2 enzymatic activity actually have faster progression of Parkinson's disease. So, in response to this understanding of how LARC2 may be important for the development of Parkinson's disease, a number of therapies are in development. Uh, Denali Therapeutics has developed small molecule uh, brain penetrant drugs, which are taken orally, and can then uh, decrease the activity of LARC2 and decrease the, uh, the amount of proteins that are phosphorylated because uh, the LARC2 uh, enzyme uh, actually phosphorylates, uh, phosphorylates various proteins. And in fact, uh, another concept is to perform gene therapy. And in this case, you can inject an antisense oligonucleotide, which is a string of RNA 
into the spinal fluid, and as a result, it gets beyond the blood-brain barrier, goes into the brain, and this can then encode for a protein which can inhibit then uh, that can inhibit or knock down uh, LARC2 production. So, and there are ongoing early phase clinical trials showing proof of concept for these particular strategies. So, in the population, we could apply these kind of therapies to individuals who have LARC2 mutations, individual and who have Parkinson's disease, individuals who have specific mutations. In the United States, the most common mutation is the so-called G2019S mutation. So if you are a carrier of that mutation, but don't you have Parkinson's disease, we might be able to give you the medication to prevent you from getting Parkinson's disease. Uh, it could be given to individuals who have other mutations, the so-called Asian variant. It could be individuals who have variations in LARC2, but don't have specific mutations. And these individuals may be at higher risk of developing Parkinson's disease individuals who have Parkinson's disease, but have high LARC2 activity, and then it, perhaps it might be effective in all individuals with Parkinson's disease by inhibiting LARC2. So many individuals, potentially all individuals with Parkinson's disease might benefit from these LARC2 inhibitory therapies. Now, the next gene I'd like to talk about is a gene called GBA or glucocerebrosidase. We know that if you have a mutation in both copies of this gene, you will develop a lysosomal storage disorder called Gaucher's disease. The lysosome is an important uh, component of most cells. It is a so-called organelle, and this is like a garbage dump that has a, a, the ability to break up the abnormal garbage proteins. So lysosomes fuse with uh, abnormal uh, 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 garbage proteins to break them up. And if your garbage system is not working, you have, of course, accumulation of garbage proteins in cells, which can result in dysfunctional cells, cell death, and disease. If you have one abnormal uh, GBA uh, or glucocerebrosidase gene, you'll have lower activity then of your overall glucocerebrosidase. And so if you have one abnormal gene, you have a risk of developing Parkinson's disease of about 30 to uh, about 30 of about 30 percent by age 80. And again, as in with LARC2 mutations, mutations in the glucocerebrosidase gene are more common in certain populations. And this is also the case with Ashkenazi Jewish population. If one looks at all individuals who have Parkinson's disease, mutations in the GBA gene are really common. About 10% of people out there in the community have mutations in GBA. So testing for this is perhaps very important because this may be the most important easily targetable risk factor gene for patients with Parkinson's disease. So um, if you have uh, a, a mutation in GBA, not only will, will you, are you more likely to get Parkinson's disease, but if you get Parkinson's disease, you're more likely to have so-called REM sleep behavior disorder and more likely to develop cognitive impairment or dementia. So it affects the prognosis in Parkinson's disease also. If you have loss of function then of this enzyme glucocerebrosidase, which is encoded for by the GBA gene, you have impaired lysosomal function, and as a result, you can't mop up and destroy that misfolded alpha-synuclein. So it accumulates, aggregates, and this further bungs up and messes up the, the lysosomal function, which results in more abnormal proteins accumulate. We know that in the individuals um, who have uh, run-of-the-mill Parkinson's who don't have mutations, we know that the activity of this glucocerebrosidase enzyme is reduced. And if you have the uh, lower glucocerebrosidase activity uh, and you have Parkinson's disease, you have faster progression compared to those who have Parkinson's disease with higher activity of this enzyme. So how could we potentially intervene? Well, we know that uh, there is a, a metabolic pathway where glucocerebrosidase works. This, it's involved in the so-called metabolism of sphingolipids. Glucocerebrosidase breaks down a sphingolipid called glucosal ceramide. We see at the top middle uh, part of this screen. And it breaks it down, then it, it breaks it down. Now, if glucocerebrosidase is not active, we may be able to intervene in this pathway in a number of ways. We could reduce the substrate, as we can see on the left, this glucosal ceramide, by inhibiting 
the production of glucosal ceramide by, by <clears throat> glucosal ceramide synthase inhibitors. However, unfortunately, these inhibitors can't get into the brain. So although they help people who have Gaucher disease, they don't help the brain problems. Well, what else could we do? Well, we could potentially, uh, we could potentially give enzyme replacement. We could give the, the enzyme directly and give it by IV. Unfortunately, again, it can help the peripheral manifestations of Gaucher disease, but doesn't get into the brain. We could inject via a viral vector the gene directly into the spinal fluid and get it into the brain. And indeed, that is being done. And then other things we could do is we could give small orally administered molecules or other ways of giving molecules which get into the brain, which can restore or increase the activity of the leftover glucose repositis activity and help us break down the glucosal ceramide and reduce the reduction in activity of that organelle, the lysosome. So th there are a number of different molecules which are being looked at it's in these different strategies. The uh, most important one that has recently been tested is one called Vengusta. And this, unlike the other glucosal ceramide synthase inhibitors, remember, we're talking about um, uh, bl uh, blocking the enzyme, which is at the top uh, left here, glucosal ceramide synthase, which results in the production of the substrate for our abnormal enzyme glucocerebrosidase. Unfortunately, a large scale study called the MOOS PD study uh, recently reported out, and unfortunately, uh, earlier this winter, did not show slowing of progression of Parkinson's disease in individuals with either mutations in the GBA gene or those who um, uh, did not have mutations in the GBA gene. Another uh, molecule, however, has shown promise that works in a different way. This is a drug called Ambroxol. Ambroxol is actually a marketed drug in Europe, especially in the UK, which can be used actually to thin and break down mucus. And uh, what we do know is that Ambroxol actually facilitates the, the movement of the misfolded and, um, and mutant glucocerebrosidase protein to the lysosome and increases the activity of the glucocerebrosidase in the lysosome to break down and reduce alpha-synuclein levels. And this has been shown in patients both with and without GBA mutation, so including idiopathic Parkinson's disease individuals. And we can see that if you check the spinal fluid in individuals taking this medication, we see a biomarker suggesting that indeed this drug may be effective. So now from this early proof of concept study, we need to go to a study that can actually look now at the actual clinical efficacy of Ambroxol. And then I mentioned that you may be able to replace the uh, gene um, that is abnormal by injecting via a viral vector into the spinal fluid the GBA gene, and, uh, and then you could transfect the brain with the virus and get the brain then to, to produce normal glucose rebrositis, even though you have mutations. And so a very small proof of concept study is being done to look at whether or not this strategy in a proof of concept study may be effective. So who could benefit potentially from these GBA related really treatments? Of course, patients who have mutations in both uh, genes for GBA and have Gaucher disease and Parkinson's disease, patients who have one mutation in GBA and have Parkinson's disease, people who have variants of GBA, which can reduce activity in glucose rebrosidase, we could benefit. And then individuals who have Parkinson's disease, and we see that they have, they have varyingly low levels of glucose rebrosidase, and then in the, all individuals potentially with Parkinson's might benefit indeed, since we think that this lysosomal dysfunction is important in all patients with Parkinson's disease to varying, a varying extent. So the concept here then is we have a number of targeted therapies directed against alpha-synuclein, against LARC2, and against glucocerebrosidase, all of which might allow us to slow the progression of Parkinson's disease. Another interesting strategy is targeting the, glu the glucagon-like um, uh, protein receptor uh, uh, by giving an agonist uh, of this specific receptor. This is an interesting um, uh, receptor, and it's very important in diabetes. And in fact, drugs that bind to this receptor are approved diabetes medications. In the brain, we know there's abnormal 
uh, glucose metabolism in patients who have Parkinson's disease. And we also know that diabetes is actually a risk factor for Parkinson's disease progression. Uh, it's very interesting that there's actually inflammatory process that occurs in Parkinson's disease in the brain. And there's activation of the inflammatory cells, which are called microglia in patients with Parkinson's disease. Administering these drugs, which, are, which bind to this GLP-1 receptor, actually may reverse and slow down this process. So, interest, and this was, has been shown in animal models of Parkinson's disease. So, in response to this, a clinical trial has been carried out using a drug called Xenotide. Xenotide, as I mentioned, is a marketed drug for type 2 diabetes. <clears throat> and this was a single blind, randomized study of patients with Parkinson's disease who had mid stage Parkinson's disease more than five years and were on levodopa therapy. And they were tested for 12 months on drug and then they had a two month washout. And what is interesting is that patients taking the Xenotide in dots had slower progression on the left side of their motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease compared to progression in solid line in patients on placebo. And we saw that actually cognition did not decline and in fact improved in patients taking the medication Xenotide compared to the placebo treated arm. And so as a result of this very interesting study, uh, there are a number of GLP-1 receptor agonists which are being tested now in patients with Parkinson's disease. And um, I'm pleased to say that we are testing a modified version of Xenotide called pegylated Xenotide in individuals who have newly diagnosed Parkinson's disease, less than five years, and are not on any treatment for Parkinson's. So they have very mild Parkinson's disease at present and are functioning well without medicines to see if in this double-blind placebo-controlled study, we can slow the progression of Parkinson's disease. And Xenotide is an easy medicine because you just have to take it once a week by a, by a subcutaneous injection that you can give yourself. And what we do see is that this medication in animal models of Parkinson's disease reduces uh, the activation of the microglia, which are the inflammatory cells in the brain, and results in reduction of neurotoxic cytokines, which are chemicals which allow communication between cells, um, and results in loss of dopamine cells, and progression of Parkinson's in these animal models, animal models. So we are hopeful that indeed we can show that we can slow progression of Parkinson's disease by administering these medications to patients with early Parkinson's. An important concept is the concept of biomarkers. Um, biomarkers are uh, 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 ways in which we can detect Parkinson's disease and make a more accurate diagnosis. We know that in early Parkinson's disease, at least 25 to 40% of patients are misdiagnosed. Either they don't have Parkinson's and they have another disease, or they are thought to have another disease and they have Parkinson's disease, in fact. And so we'd like to be more accurate in our diagnosis, especially earlier on. And in fact, we'd like to maybe be able to make a diagnosis in that prodromal, pre-symptomatic phase of the disease. So that if we have a disease modifying therapy, we could begin it really early. And in fact, begin it before symptoms even begin if possible, and even prevent Parkinson's disease. And then if you're being given a treatment to slow the progression of Parkinson's disease, we'd like to have a better way than just looking at clinical symptoms to see if we are slowing the progression of Parkinson's disease. In addition, we'd like markers to indicate how you might respond to a particular therapy so we can customize and give you the therapy which is most likely to be helpful for you. So a number of biomarkers have been looked at, including looking at, at, at samples of different fluids in the brain, such as spinal fluid or blood, doing gene testing, doing special kinds of scans, such as PET scans or SPECT scans, testing, smell, as well as doing various biopsies, including skin. Now, what is uh, truly uh, quite uh, uh, fantastic in this past year is that we're beginning to be able to more definitively make tissue diagnoses and liquid uh, biopsies in Parkinson's disease to be more certain about the diagnosis. So we talked about the fact that in Parkinson's disease, we have misfolding and spread of alpha-synuclein. And now what we can do is we can look at, at the different substrains of, of alpha-synuclein in the body, and we can determine if you have Parkinson's disease, you have uh, other disorders which are caused by misfolding of, of alpha-synuclein, such as multiple systems atrophy or dementia with Lewy bodies, all of also which cause Parkinsonian syndromes. And so we can find out 
these, which if you have a synucleinopathy, and by looking at the sub, uh, looking at the strains, we can find out um, uh, what is your underlying diagnosis with a high degree of accuracy. And it may be possible to determine substrains of alpha synuclein, even to be able to determine what particular clinical problems you might develop over time if you have a new diagnosis of Parkinson's disease by looking at the substrain of the misfolded alpha synuclein you have in your body. So. There have been some tremendous publications um, uh, by a variety of groups using new techniques to process spinal fluid in patients with Parkinson's disease using techniques called uh, PMCA and RT Quick. And we can indeed differentiate, you can see on the far left, the substrain, the strain of Parkinson's disease, multiple systems actually from healthy control. And we can we can, we can see tremendous. Uh, differences in the fluorescence uh, pattern and when the, the samples are processed. And indeed, this is replicable if one looks at patients who have, who have died and have autopsy-proven Parkinson's disease, we can differentiate these different strains of alpha synuclein. Now, it is possible to apply this concept of alpha synuclein strain recognition not only to spinal fluid, but now we can look at peripheral tissue. And this has been applied to biopsies of skin, and of submandibular gland tissue. So increasingly, we're going to be able to make a definitive tissue diagnosis or liquid biopsy diagnosis of Parkinson's disease and be more certain about the diagnosis, which will help us uh, treat patients better and also make sure we're enrolling the correct patients in trials of different new medications to try to slow the progression of Parkinson's. Now, other biomarkers which have become increasingly uh, useful and are being studied are studies looking at the retinal fiber layer uh, in, of the eye in patients with Parkinson's disease. And we see, using a technique called OCT, or optical coherence tomography, that there is thinning of this layer. Also, uh, we can see that if one looks at the blood or spinal fluid in patients with Parkinson's disease, that a marker of brain damage called NFL, or neurofilament light, is increased. And if one has a higher level of this, this correlates with worse prognosis and more severe motor symptoms and worse DAT scan for, uh, progression over time in patients with Parkinson's. Now, I mentioned that it'd be important to develop a way to image the aberrant alpha synuclein in the brain. And there's been a great deal of progress in this respect. And we expect that this year, this imaging agent developed in Japan will indeed now be translated from being tested in animal models and monkey models of Parkinson's disease to human trials. And what we can see here is if one injects in the brain of a marmoset, which is a kind of monkey, misfolded alpha-synuclein fibrils, one can get a, a, loss of, a loss of the dopamine transporter and clinical Parkinsonism, as we can see in the bottom right, where we see a, this small blue circle compared to the large green circle on the right. And we see on the left side, we can see increased deposition in the right SN or substantia nigra where the dopamine cells are of this marker, this imaging marker targeting alpha synuclein in the brain. So we expect that there will be very uh, uh, much progress made on imaging of Parkinson's disease using this marker this next year. In addition, a variety of MRI techniques have been developed, which also allow identification quite well of Parkinson's compared to healthy controls. These are now uh, techniques which are going to be moved from experiments, experiments into the regular clinic, I would say, in this next year. And 3T MRI using special processing techniques will uh, be available to also help us in our diagnosis of Parkinson's disease and differentiate from controls and beyond. So we're gonna have increasing tools to be used clinically and be used for studies. Now, I'd like to quickly review some symptomatic therapies in the, uh, that are in trials for uh, Parkinson's disease. There are a number of symptomatic therapies that are, being, uh, that are being tested to help control motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease. As you know, in early Parkinson's disease, um, uh, patients may not need symptoms, but as symptoms uh, may not need symptomatic treatment. But as the disease progresses, treatment with medicines for symptoms can be extremely helpful. Levodopa is the gold treatment, um, uh, is the gold standard treatment for patients with Parkinson's disease. Now, giving levodopa can improve symptoms, but as it's given in higher doses for a longer period of time, patients can develop excess involuntary movements, so-called dyskinesia. And the effect of an individual dose of levodopa can become shorter 
So the, the medication wears off between doses. And this results in so-called motor fluctuations. There's an interesting new dopamine agonist called tavapadon, which we are studying, which acts on, on a different kind of, D, of dopamine receptor than the current dopamine receptor. So this acts predominantly in D1 and D5 receptors. And in the phase two large scale studies, it's been shown that these seem to have, this medication seems to have greater efficacy and less side effects than current dopamine agonists such as pramipexol or rapinrol or ritigatine. And so we're doing uh, uh, double blind placebo controlled studies in patients who have early Parkinson's disease, who are not yet on levodopa therapy, who need greater control of their symptoms. And we're doing studies in patients who are on levodopa or are experiencing this wearing off between doses or motor fluctuations to see if we can improve symptoms of Parkinson's disease. And, and so um, uh, these are double blind placebo controlled studies. And then patients who complete those studies will receive long term open label drug. Now, one of the problems with Parkinson's disease is the way we give levodopa, and it cannot be given continuously. If we can give anti Parkinson medication via pump therapy, that could be helpful. Apomorphine is a short acting dopamine agonist, which can be given sublingually um, or it can be given by injection. In, uh, and this is known as Kinmobi and Apokin. Well, it's actually a better drug to give continuously via pump therapy. And it's been approved in Europe to be given this way for a long period of time. And we have patients who are receiving open label, long-term apomorphine pump therapy for troublesome motor fluctuations. And this pump you can see is pretty small. It's very similar to an insulin pump and can be kept in your pocket or put on a, a bell clip. And it's been shown that in, uh, in double blind placebo controlled studies that this therapy substantially reduces off time. In addition, we are currently studying new subcutaneous levodopa therapies. So levodopa we give by mouth, but it's much better if you can give it continuously. And the best way to do it is by giving via small pump uh, and injecting it under the skin continuously so that you prevent the ups and downs of levodopa uh, levels in the, in the blood and dopamine levels in the brain. So by continuously administering it, you could improve uh, Parkinson's disease motor fluctuations. And so Neuroderm is a company that makes a drug called 0612. And this is a, uh, a form of, 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 of levodopa carbidopa solution. And we are studying it in a double blind placebo controlled study in patients who have troublesome motor fluctuations. And in this study, patients have a three month double blind phase and they have long term open label uh, use of the medication to improve motor fluctuations. In open label studies, we found that it's very it's a very helpful therapy. So increasingly, once patients get motor fluctuations, we see that in the future, patients will now very quickly, just as with, with diabetes, we switch to continuous pump therapy and we'll have much better motor control. Indeed, there's another formulation of, of, of subcutaneous levodopa, which we are studying called FOS carbidopa, FOS levodopa, made by another company called Abbey. And this also, in open label studies, seems to be highly effective in providing continuous dopamine stimulation and improving motor fluctuations. And we have patients currently enrolled in phase three long term studies. Now, I mentioned dyskinesias. Dyskinesias are excess involuntary movements, which can really affect the quality of life of patients and can complicate levodopa therapy. And here we can see one of my patients. Uh, from a long time ago, and you can see how she's rocking and rolling, and she has head rocking movements, and these dyskinesias are very bothersome to her. And in fact, uh, if we see her, if we see her walk, you can see she's wiggling all over the place, and her right arm is behind her back, and she needs the nurse even to help keep her up because she might fall down. Uh, so dyskinesias can really be a problem for some patients who have Parkinson's disease. Now, it would be nice to have better medications to control dyskinesia. And indeed, uh, there are approved medications. Amantadine can be helpful, and an extended release formulation called Gocovery is available. However, um, there are new medications to control dyskinesia, which we are currently studying and that look very promising and work in a different way than amantadine. One of them is a drug called mesdopitam, and uh, another drug <clears throat> is called diprogluranth. And we're doing double blind placebo control studies of these medications uh, to see if we can improve dyskinesia without worsening Parkinsonism. And patients cannot be taking amantadine, uh, but they must have troublesome dyskinesia affecting them pretty much every day to be eligible to participate in these trials. Now, as I mentioned a moment ago, uh, over time, many patients develop cognitive impairment, and this can be a substantial source of disability. 
There are many uh, current trials being looking at medications to try to slow the progression of Parkinson's disease. I'd like to briefly comment on one we recently completed, which is a plasma protein infusion for treatment of cognitive impairment in Parkinson's disease. This comes around, uh, around as a result of the concept of parabiosis, whereby you hook up uh, and you transfer plasma proteins from a young mouse to an old mouse, and you can see an improvement in motor function and in cognitive function. And you see a number of changes actually in the brain that suggest it may be helpful. And indeed, uh, we have done, uh, uh, trials have been done in patients who have mild to moderate Alzheimer's disease showing improvement in cognitive symptoms. So as a result of this, we did double-blind placebo-controlled trial in patients who had mild cognitive impairment or mild Parkinson's disease dementia. And we recently found, and this was reported just uh, last month at the ADPD meeting, that we was an improvement in cognition and improvement in quality of life. So we expect larger scale studies of this infusion therapy, which is given approximately every three months to uh, be uh, starting later this year, hopefully, to see if we can replicate and expand the improvements that we saw earlier in patients who have cognitive impairment with Parkinson's disease. In addition, we recently did a study with Lilly looking at a drug called metavalin, which acts to increase the activity of, uh, of dopamine at the dopamine 1 receptor. And this double-blind placebo-controlled study in patients with Parkinson's dementia and dementia with Lewy bodies uh, didn't improve cognition overall, but did improve Parkinsonism and a number of other non-motor symptoms. So we think that uh, additional trials of this medication will occur this year. Lastly, I'd like to mention that uh, we, are, we are just starting now a study of a new drug that works on a cholinergic receptor. We know that there is degeneration of not only dopamine cells, but many other types of cells in Parkinson's disease, including cells that produce this brain chemical called acetylcholine. And so the cholinergic system degenerates very much in Parkinson's disease and even more than in Alzheimer's disease. The cholinergic system is very important in memory and also gait control. And if you give this medication a call, the call to CATA 71 to transgenic animal models of Parkinson, you can see that these animals have improvement in memory when you do cognitive tasks with them, like running mazes, and you can see improvements in their ability to walk. So we are just starting now a study in patients who have mild cognitive impairment or mild dementia with Parkinson and have trouble with their balance and have had some falls to see if we can improve walking, balance, reduce falls, and importantly, improve cognition. So there's lots going on in Parkinson's disease. Um, I think I'm all out of time. So I'm just going, I'm going to skip the last few of my slides here. Uh, and I'd love to take questions from the audience now. So uh, I, I would just like to wrap up and just simply say that uh, it takes a long time to develop new medications in Parkinson's disease. It costs a lot of money. And one of the big problems is that there's slowness uh, to get uh, drugs to patients. And uh, some of this comes from the fact that it takes a long time to get the clinical trials done. And that's often because of slowness uh, to get enough patients into these clinical trials. Uh, so we really need your help and participation to bring new therapies to patients and families affected by Parkinson's disease. So I would strongly encourage you, if you're interested, to speak to my research coordinators, Beth Capozzi and Jay Carney, um, at the Clinical Research Fair um, uh, at our booth to see whether or not you might be able to help uh, in uh, our struggle to help uh, everyone affected by a Parkinson's disease. Again, thank you for your attention. Uh, I'm happy to take questions. Thanks. I'm hey, going to stop thank you. sharing now so we can take questions. Thank you, Dr. Kumar. Um, we, um, we only have time for maybe one question, um, but what we are going to do is transfer the remaining questions over to the Movement Disorder Foundation booth, um, and hopefully they can get answers to your questions. So I'm going to start with a question from Andrea. Besides your doctor, where can we request genetic testing for Parkinson's? Yeah, so um, you, can, you cannot get, as far as I know, um, uh, medical grade genetic testing on your own. Uh, so you'll need to request it to your, to your doctor uh, if you want medical grade genetic testing. You can get uh, uh, rather poor quality genetic testing through 23andMe, which doesn't test for most of the mutations causing most of the gene, in most of the genes that cause Parkinson's disease. The Michael J. Fox Foundation does the so-called Fox Insight program, which tests for one mutation in the LARC2 and one in the GBA gene, but you miss most of the mutations, not only in those genes, but in all the other genes. So I would encourage you to talk with your doctor. There are both commercially, there are many commercially available panels, including a free panel from a genetic testing company called Invite. So I would encourage you to talk with your neurologist. 
Okay, thank you so much. And, and we are unfortunately out of time, but again, we will take the rest of the questions and move them over to the booth for the Rocky Mountain Movement Disorders Foundation. And there are researchers there who will most likely be able to answer most of your questions. Um, if not, they can always get an answer for you and come back. So I want to thank you so much, um, Dr. Kumar, for joining us today. The, the advances in clinical research are amazing. And I really think there's a lot to be hopeful about as we look forward.